Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's event with Wendy Lower discussing her latest book, The Ravine, A Family, A Photograph, and A Holocaust Massacre Revealed. She is joined tonight in conversation by Joshua Rubenstein. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our new digital community during these challenging times. Our spring season is in full swing, so make sure you check out our event schedule on harvard.com events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk tonight, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you'd like to purchase a copy of The Ravine, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you, especially during this difficult time for community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link in the donate for donation in the chat if you'd like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you so much for tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support, especially now. And as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings this past year, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Now, I am so pleased to introduce today's speakers. Wendy Lower is currently the William Rosenberg Senior Scholar at Yale University and Director for the McGrillbin Center for Human Rights. She is the author of Nazi Empire Building and the Holocaust in the Ukraine, the Diary of Samuel Goldfard and the Holocaust in Galicia. And she is the co-editor of Shoah in the Ukraine. Her book, Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields was a finalist for the National Book Award and has been translated into 23 different languages. It is, a, is it, excuse me, it is a spectacular book on a subject that is often overlooked by Holocaust historians. Joshua Rubenstein is, the stat, is on the staff of Amnesty International USA from 1975 to 2012 as the Northeast Regional Director. He is an associate of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. Joshua is the author and editor of many books, including Stalin's Secret Pro Pogrom, The Post-War Inquis Inquisition of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, which received the National Jewish Book Award and Last Days of Stalin, which has been published in nine languages. Today, they're discussing the ravine. The story starts with a picture of a nightmare, a mother and two children on the brink of murder. Through Wendy's forensic and archival detective work, we took her through the Ukraine, Germany, Slovakia, Israel, and the US. She recovers astonishing layers of detail concerning the open air massacres in the Ukraine as she seeks to find the identities of the family, their killers, and the photographer. Through this single image, Wendy unlocks a new understanding of the place of the family unit in the ideology of a Nazi genocide. Now I'll turn things over to our authors, Wendy, Joshua, Thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks. Hello, you. Audrey. Yeah, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Hi, Wendy. Hi. How uh, are you? I'm great. How are you tonight? Good. Congratulations on your book. Thank you. Let me say a few words of introduction. We're talking about uh, one of many, many killings that took place during the war targeting Jews on the Eastern Front. For many people who know about the Holocaust, the, the typical image is the story of Anne Frank, a family of Dutch Jews in Amsterdam who are hunted down, discovered, and sent to the killing centers in Poland. Or people have heard of places like Auschwitz and Treblinka. But the killings on the Eastern Front, on German-occupied Soviet territory, are less well known. To remind everyone, World War II began at the end of August, beginning of September, when first Nazi Germany and then Soviet Russia, Soviet Union under Stalin, invaded and divided Poland. So for two years, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were allies. Though during those two years, Nazi Germany invaded the Low Countries, uh, Holland and Belgium. They occupied Paris, they took over France. And they began the Battle of Britain with an attempt to invade Great Britain, which failed, of course. 
And then Hitler surprised Stalin in June of 1941 by launching an enormous invasion into Soviet territory. What took place in the initial months after June 22, 1941 staggers the imagination. Soviet defenses collapsed, allowing the Wehrmacht, the German army, to advance 350 miles in the first 10 days. They captured Vilna on June 24th, Minsk, the capital of Belarus, on June 28th, Riga on, Jul on July 1st. Kiev was captured on September 19th, and the enormous massacre of Jews at Babi Yar outside Kiev started 10 days later when over 30, 37,000 Jews were killed in Babi Yar over two days of continuous shooting. Leningrad, the 900 day siege of Leningrad began on September 8th. So all this took place within just months of the German invasion of Soviet territory. So we're talking about one of thousands and thousands of killings that took place on German occupied Soviet territory. We now believe that as many as two and a half million of the six million Jews killed during the Holocaust were actually residents of the Soviet Union as defined by the borders of June 1941. So tell us, Wendy, how did you decide to start your, to focus your scholarly career on the Holocaust and what inspired you to write the ravine? Thank you for that, that question and, and for providing that very important historical context. My uh, journey, as it were, into Holocaust studies um, began uh, in actually the late 80s, early 90s. And it coincided with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so I didn't go into graduate school with the intention of, of writing these books and doing this kind of research. I I'd had an interest in Nazi Germany. I had the German language skills and I was a history major as an undergraduate. But these global events started happening while I was in school. And that started to open up worlds for me and opportunities for me, um, particularly in what was the territory of the former Soviet Union and the archives. And my advisor, uh, Professor Richard Brightman, who had written a book on Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, had worked in an archive in Jatomer, Ukraine, which is where Himmler had his headquarters during the war and, and not too far from Hitler's headquarters. And so in the summer of 1992, my head was in my first year of graduate school. I went to these archives, uh, drove there with a friend and just started to collect documentation and much of that documentation was the you know, origins of my dissertation, definitely, but also the origins of, of Hitler's Furies. And it wasn't so much the origins of this book, but it brought me to this uh, terrain, to this location, and in touch with the witnesses um, and what was left of the Jewish community, uh, and, and gave me a whole new perspective of the Holocaust as it occurred outside the camp system in this um, in the Holocaust by bullets, as Father Dubois calls it, or in these bloodlands, as Timothy Snyder calls them. Right, and then you came across a particular photograph. Yes, and so during the, the course of my education and my career in Holocaust studies, and, and, and at that time as well in the 90s, I worked at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. And I mentioned that because when I worked on these exhibits, um, and then I would go on to actually um, direct the Mandel Center there for a few years, um, 2017. Um, I became uh, really uh, immersed in the kind of physical material, the evidence, whether it was the large photography that was on display, um, the visual evidence, the artifacts, um, the testimonies. So I was working you know, in the archives on my dissertation, but then working in a public museum, an institution in which storytelling is driven by these kinds of, you know, uh, multimedia and how things are brought together to tell stories based on different artifacts and images. And I started to notice um, as I was working on these exhibits, how certain images became really iconic. And when I would go to Yad Vashem, I'd see the same images, or I'd go, you know, I'd look in textbooks and I'd see the same images. Um, and realized on the one hand that these were, bring, these were brought in as illustrations, but not really studied in and of themselves as sources um, on the one hand. And secondly, that there was this discussion about atrocity photography and what are ethical kind of rules um, or sensitivities were as far as um, displaying them. And, and then as a teacher and as a professor, 
the use of imagery in the classroom and the challenges of that pedagogically started to um, become part of my, um, my thinking and my um, kind of intellectual, cur my, my curiosity. And, and I would, I guess, add at the end that um, in, in real life, outside the classroom, as it were, and outside the archives, um, becoming increasingly aware of the power of the image in the in the age, the digital age, and the internet age, and the visual culture that you know has started, you know, since the really the advent of, of photography really taking off, but but increasingly um, now, um, and certainly not what I had as a student growing up, and that maybe we need to to, to look more carefully at how we are using um, images um, in the classroom. I mean, any a photograph of, of suffering or violence, like the one we're going to look at in a few minutes, and we should warn our audiences today that we're going to be looking at some pretty graphic images. Um, that they're so they're, they they propel people into action, into humanitarian action, even kind of social justice campaigns. I mean, think about the naked girl attacked in Vietnam, the napalm attack, or the little boy Alan Curdy who washed up on the beach in Bodrum, and how that um, kind of uh, heightened the discussion on, on the refugee crisis in Europe. Um, so it got me thinking about images as not only source material um, to be researched, um, but also about the power of imagery as, uh, as, as an agent of change, uh, whether it's the pursuit of justice or teaching, um, but that it, that this, there's this power in the image that I really wanted to uh, try to um, study more closely. So I know you have images you'd like to share with us this evening. Yes. Okay, here's the book. So here we have, um, um, let me get, these are some images that uh, are the kinds of iconic ones that we see on display in museums and often in books. And they become a kind of shorthand or, or instant recall for Holocaust history. When I talk to my students and I ask them at the end of the semester, you know, tell me about you, what you know about the Holocaust. They're usually just describing some of these images, but not with very much information or much detail. But this is this is a way we kind of collectively remember and recall that the Holocaust often is through these images um, uh, more than say other sources like Nazi documents or or even the, the written word. It's just, just the way we work cognitively. So I was fascinated by that, but actually realized that these images um, uh, with the exception of, of probably this one here called The Last Jew in Vinica, um, that many of them show the, uh, depict the history as kind of in passive ways or in um, static ways, the, the entrance to, to Birkenau or even, you know, corp bones in, 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 in Bergen-Belsen, for instance. Um, uh, this is another one from Ivana Gorod, very famous. Often it's cropped here. You don't realize that actually um, the woman with the child, this is a, a probably SD, Einsatzgruppen killer here in Southern Ukraine, but actually the rest of the family is here and is, is uh, I believe is, is digging. And, and I think they're actually having forced to dig their own grave. Here we have the little boy from the Warsaw Ghetto with his arms raised, uh, also a very important image. This version is cropped in the, in the bigger image that was in a Nazi photo album. There's a, uh, a killer kind of in the background here um, and the East Germans caught up with him and, and um, convicted him and they use this image to find him. So it's also, again, about the pursuit of justice. But um, the image that is the subject of my book, uh, which I'm going to put up now, um, it just it, it, it just was so uh, astounding to me, shocking, disturbing, haunting, there are many ways to describe it. I've been kind of living with it since 2009 when it was first uh, brought to my attention. I was in the archives of the Holocaust Museum actually working on, an, on another case and it was just serendipity. I wasn't even living in DC at the time. I was living in Germany and had flown back to do research in the archives. And these two journalists had arrived that day in August. Uh, they had come from Prague. They had this, this image and it's very kind of common is that people come to the museum in DC and they've got something they wanna share, they wanna find out more about. Um, and they've drawn the resources there on site in the library and the archives. And my colleague was there um, who knew that I worked on Ukraine and the, the journalist who brought this image had kind of unearthed it from a KGB like archive in Prague. It had been locked up for decades, hadn't seen the light of days a day, was not, had not been used in any war crimes um, case um, uh, against these killers who were in the image. Um, and what do they have? They had the photograph, 
They had the name of the photographer, Lubomir Skrovina, um, from Banska B Street, um, and the date of the photograph, October 13th, 1941, and that the photograph was taken in Miropil, Ukraine, which is about 100 miles west um, of Kiev. Uh, and that was really what kind of started me on this, on this research uh, uh, journey um, that culminated in the book, uh, The Ravine. So what did I find particularly striking on this image? And, and Josh, feel free to, um, to interrupt at any time if you want to uh, sure. you know, uh, also comment on some of the facets of the image. And I know you've read the book as well. Um, well, I started to pick apart the pieces of it um, and thought about how it was. they were kind of representative to me. They spoke to me, these pieces of the image, as far as what we know of Holocaust memorialization, so the empty shoes. Um, and I kind of start with that and then I end the book with the shoes and I will be uh, reading, hopefully if we have time a little bit from the epilogue and the power of these, the meaning um, and the metaphor of these empty shoes here. There's some papers um, kind of strewn about there. If you look really closely um, and now with the advent of, of digital technology and we're zooming in and zooming out, you can see actually the bullet casings, the kind of litter of mass murder there. The environment, uh, I, I had uh, the advantage, you know, when I started this project in 2009, the field of Holocaust studies has advanced uh, over the decades during my lifetime into interdisciplinary kinds of um, projects and um, uh, a kind of team uh, uh, collaborative projects in the best sense of the word. Um, and environmental history uh, has made some really good inroads into Holocaust studies and of course, forensic archeology. span And so looking at this and looking at the landscape of mass murder and how the Nazis put nature to work here. Um, uh, we can see the, the ravine, the, the kind of the soil here that's, that's crumbling down uh, or the pit that's been dug. And that was very deliberate that the Germans forced the victims to stand at the precipice so that they would, and then sometimes they used a, a, like a stick and put like push them in so that they would fall into the pit, um, into the mass grave, using the soil then to cover up the bodies and suffocate those who are um, still alive in the pit. This is in broad daylight, which means that you're going to obviously have um, um, onlookers and witnesses. Uh, this is in a forest setting uh, near a river. Now, what does mass murder do to the landscape and the terrain as far as decomposition? And I have a chapter in there about that, uh, reading the reading the terrain and, and finding the clues there. And um, the collaborators here, the collaborators, I mean, in a way, this, this kind of um, image of collaboration where you have, these are two Ukrainians uh, wearing uh, Red Army coats, militia men who've been kind of recruited on the spot, and then these German officials with their visors or caps and the insignia, and I can make out their uniforms, and um, and then the man in the back who's a kind of helper with that beret, and they're pointing their guns, and the, the Ukrainian has an expression, he's kind of grimacing, he's in the act of shooter shooting, the, the, the act of, of murder, um, and they're shoulder to shoulder here. They are... Uh, um, you know, they don't speak the same language, they're Ukrainian and Germans, and they've just kind of come together at this moment, um, and um, they, you know, know what to do, they can still communicate um, what to do. Here we have uh, in their shared anti-Semitism. The smoke is another clue, and I ultimately worked with a ballistics person who helped me interpret why the, the smoke is in this way, in this form, um, the blast, the muzzle blast, um, which is um, typical for a kind of execution with multiple firing um, and the halo kind of over the woman's head. I'm, I'm sorry to sound so kind of forensic and, and kind of um, scientific in my explanation, but this is how I was trying to get at what happened and what happened to these to these victims and um, and to try to restore um, ultimately the names of these victims. And um, this is not how they wanted to be photographed their last minutes of life, right? Um, and what do we do when we find a picture like this? What is our, how do we respond to this, um, this uh, evidence of murder and this family here in the center and, and holding his hand, the boy and his barefooted and her polka dotted dress and her, her shoes and the position that she's in and, and, and ultimately discovering that there was another soul here on her lap, I could tell from her posture and then being able to, to, 
to use the technology to determine that was another another person there, another child there. Um, so this, these were the first kinds of reactions I had and how I thought about what could potentially be um, unlocked or, or discovered in this photo and to, to try to figure out what happened before, during and after and to the people in the photo, what were their names and, and what happened to them after the war. And um, you know, could those killers, for instance, be brought to justice. I uh, had mentioned that I was working on a case in the archives when I first found this. So I was really kind of obsessed at the time with um, helping um, identify any remaining perpetrators. And um, these, it turned out that one of the Ukrainian killers was really young. He was a minor at the time. He was um, uh, uh, 17 years old. Uh, and I, I thought the first thing I needed to do was actually, I couldn't, um, Restore, you know, I could. I, the, these these victims were gone, um, uh, and the, I could maybe pursue their their identities and, and seek that kind of um, historical justice. But maybe the uh, one of the perpetrators was still alive. So the first thing I did was to try to find the documentation um, that might identify these perpetrators. And how were you able to do that, so many years later? Uh, well, this is where um, you know it's it's kind of knowing you through through colleagues through the community of colleagues because this is an endeavor that that requires many languages um the holocaust um as we are are coming to realize especially after the collapse of the soviet union and the opening up of all these archives and the study of collaboration is a european story um of course this was a german-led campaign no hitler no holocaust it was organized by the germans instigated by the germans but they had so many followers, so many participated to participants, so many collaborators. Um, and so uh, I had to go through the German documentation, for instance, and look for those units and try to figure out during the campaign who was in that town at that time, potentially what what army unit, what um, SS police unit. These uniforms um, are not regular uh, German um, Wehrmacht uh, military. Uh, they're not SS. Uh, they're not order police. Order police, there are different uh, markings on the sleeve. If it were order police, the buttons are different. The insignias are different. Um, but it took me a while to figure that out. It took years for me to um, determine that it was not, it was a customs unit um, because our photographer in a really interesting moment when he was questioned about this photograph in 1943, mentioned this important detail um, that the Germans who were uh, in this in this photograph um, worked for the finance ministry, and they were there normally checking packages at the local train station or in the post office. And they had just been uh, they volunteered. They were they just kind of recruited on the spot. Um, they saw this as an opportunity. Uh, they were um, notoriously um, uh, anti-Semitic within their within their unit. And how did you come across the name of the photographer? Well, the name of the photographer had been part of the, um, and here he is, Lubomir Shkrovina. Uh, this picture was taken uh, after the war, actually. Um, and there he is with his camera. Um, so that had that was part of um, the archival record with the photograph because um, the photographer was born in 1916. So in, uh, he was 25 years old when he took that picture. Um, and he was someone, as it turns out, who did not want to be in this war. And looking at that photograph, it's so, uh, the image is so clear and it's even composed, it kind of follows an aesthetic kind of rule of thirds. And he didn't have a, a, a zoom lens. And so we know he was standing close to the uh, killing, maybe 20 feet at, at most. Um, and in his, um, when he was questioned in 43 by the, um, in Bratislava by their uh, Jewish affairs kind of um, secret police office, um, he just mentioned, um, uh, you know, that there were these finance guards there, which was really important. And then he described, you know, what happened that day um, and why when he heard from his barracks the sound of the shooting and the screaming, um, he went to go to see what was happening. He went with a comrade and he grabbed his camera. 
He was the company's scribe, so he had his camera. He was an avid uh, a photographer, hobby photographer. This is the age of the portable camera. This is the most uh, uh, photographed war. Uh, uh, it was unprecedented, the number of images. I mean, it was Goebbels deliberately embedded photojournalists. You know, they were very um, uh, pleased to be photographing these victories and, and in a triumphalist kind of spirit. They just didn't want the photos of the crimes to go into circulation or to be uh, those photos to be taken and shared. Um, they were fearing that that would incite uh, revenge and, and acts of resistance. And in fact, our photographer was, he was a resistance fighter. Uh, um, he was sent into this campaign. He hated wearing a uniform. He hated the fascists. He just uh, had no choice. Um, and was part of his guard unit. Um, and he took this picture, um, which is kind of his enough moment to say, um, this is not uh, what I uh, uh, believe in. This is, this is not um, what I want to continue to participate in. And at that point, he was writing letters to his wife saying, my hair is turning gray. I, I, I feel this blackness seeping into my brain. He was starting to drink and talking about. Uh, and then he got out of um, continued military service. He went back for um, the Christmas break and he didn't and he, and he didn't go back to the front. He um, was checked into an asylum and his he and his wife, they kind of um, carried out this resistance effort. Uh, she pretended with him that he was sick and played along and um, and he actually took these photographs to then show uh, Jews in um, Banska Bystrica um, to warn them not to go to the East when the deportations were happening. And he actually hid uh, a Jewish family in his attic. Um, the, the, the Jewish family, um, the head of the family was an OBGYN. He actually delivered his son, Lubomir Jr. in 1943. So this, this story, this photograph is, you know, there are surprises. You look at it, you think, Whoever took this photograph, you know, must have been collaborating. He's further humiliating these victims, taking this image at such close proximity. Um, he's allowed to take them. He's there in uniform. But in fact, that was not who this person was. And when I interviewed his family, they just kind of confirmed my um, the, the portrait I was starting to paint of him. Um, and I, um, you know, was uh, very fortunate to get access to the camera and his kind of personal papers as well. Yes. Wendy, were you the first to identify the perpetrators or had someone been held accountable for this crime already? Um, well, the, the story of justice on the uh, individuals in the image is, is, is interesting. The, um, so the photographer himself is questioned by the Slovakians, also questioned by uh, the uh, kind of KGB authority in Prague after the war in 1958, 1959, when they're going after the collaborators. Um, and he manages to escape any kind of um, prosecution, the, the photographer. Uh, and, he, and ultimately, he is recognized for his resistance efforts and uh, awarded and, um, and got received commendations for that. So, um, and he, and I'll just to finish up the photographer story, he does, he donates his camera to the Museum of uh, History of the Jews in, in Bratislava, which is why we can see the camera here um, when I uh, had that opportunity to inspect it. Um, as for the other killers, the Germans, um, it's kind of a kind of a representative story in a way, as far as uh, the Soviets actually tracking down the Ukrainians and prosecuting them and convicting them because they were very aggressively going after the traitors to the homeland. Um, whereas the West Germans, which is where those German killers ended up um, near Bremen and near Hanover after the war. And um, the only thing we really know about them, uh, was generated by an event um, in 1969. So um, in January 1969, one of the members of that um, customs guard unit walked into a police station in, in, at night, actually, after hours, um, and said, you know, to the man working at the desk, the officer on duty, uh, you know, I'd like to report a crime. And, and so we have this, uh, like, police report <laughs> from in 1969, in which um, that person walks in and says, uh, 20 years ago, I was in, in this town in Russia, he got he misplaced it. And this is what happened. And he identifies um, the two killers in the photo, but the West Germans didn't have this, this image to look at. So, but I had the advantage as an historian of comparing the image with the West German, um, with the German um, 
uh, interrogations. And they, of course, um, denied participating in it, denied shooting, um, provided some more details about what happened that day, but um, uh, basically perjured themselves. Uh, um, if that photograph were uh, available uh, to the West Germans in that investigation, maybe the outcome would have been different. And what about the Ukrainian collaborators? Were they were any of them held accountable? Uh, yes. So the um, prosecutor, a prosecutor in uh, the neighboring district. So here's here's Mirapol, just to give you an idea geographically. This is actually an older map, a 17th century map of Jewish settlements in Ukraine. So it's just striking that this little town, the shtetl, uh, that at most had 4,000 Jews, about about a thousand were left when the Nazis arrived in the summer of 41. But a, a very important historic site, um, Ansky, who wrote the Dybbuk, um, a famous ethnographer in the turn of the century uh, uh, before World War I, he traveled there and collected stories and, and, and tried to capture and preserve the kind of um, the Yiddish and the way of life um, and the, um, uh, that community. Um, that was disappearing through immigration. And then um, in the First World War uh, was also an, another blow to that community and, and the Sovietization of it obviously that followed. So here we have the town. Um, and this is what it looks like when I went back the first time in 2014. And, um, and this is to show you, you know, this was a very vibrant marketplace. This is what happens when um, not only the genocide of uh, uh, during during the Second World War um, and the Sovietization uh, and the collapse of that system and uh, the, the the failure of that system, you know, economically, you can just see just what what was left here. And this is uh, after all the hyperinflation and everything in Ukraine in the '90s. Um, but this is where the Jews were gathered the night before the the shooting um, that you see in the in the photograph. Um, and um, the Ukrainian policemen who were in the militia who were in the photograph were tracked down in 1985. And it's just incredible to find this case, which was uh, thousands and thousands of, page, of pages, a really thorough investigation in contrast to the West German one that on this, on this uh, massacre. Um, and um, the Soviet prosecutors found the three killers. There were two in the picture, but there was actually a third. Um, and the two who were adults at the time were um, executed by firing squad in January 1987. Uh, and the other killer who was a minor was given um, a sentence and sent into the Russian prison system. And I don't know what happened to him. But uh, you know, this case closed in 87. I was driving through this region in the summer of 92. I mean, Ukraine got its independence in August 91. So just one of, problem, one of the last cases, uh, as far as I can tell, um, in the Soviet Union uh, pertaining to the Holocaust. Again, and the, the Soviets didn't have the photo. They didn't have um, this, this image. But when you read the um, trial record and the testimonies on the Soviet case, it, it, is, it is a description of this image. It's really a, um, matches the image. And the prosecutor forced the Ukrainians to reenact what happened and walk, you know, follow the steps. This is this, the map that they actually created in the case. Here's the center of town that I just showed you where that um, memorial is with a, a champagne bottle and the, um, and the Jews were forced to walk in this direction. See the uh, uh, prosecutor's team drew this all out. And this is the path that the Jews in, the, in our picture, that family was forced to walk into here and here is the actual park. These are the, this is, this is the, the um, killing site that is pictured in the image is, is right here. Certainly part of the story, which may surprise many of our listeners, is that the Soviet Union after World War II, in fact, during World War II, as soon as they began liberating territory from the Germans, began looking for collaborators, bringing them to justice. There were trials in Ukraine, there were trials in Russia proper, trials in the Baltic area, um, and hundreds and hundreds of trials were held after the war. And the one you just referred to took place over 40 years later. So in addition to Nuremberg and the many prosecutions in Germany, the Soviet government also, to one extent or another, in its own way, did try to hold collaborators accountable. 
And this is just one example. Yes. Yeah. There were, you know, there were about 30 Ukrainians in the militia in that town. There was no German presence really other than those customs guards. They didn't have a real outpost. There was no SS office. I mean, those SS officers who recruited those, those killers, they came into town on that Sunday night. Uh, those German customs officials were playing Scott, playing cards in the canteen. The SS came in and said, what are the Jews doing in this town? Why are they still here? We're going to get rid of them. Who wants to do this tomorrow? And boom, they, they start this whole um, uh, process because it is a step-by-step -step process. These mass shootings are not a kind of, you know, pogroms are part of it and the local population participates in it, but they are very organized. They measure out, they calculate the number of victims, they measure out um, how big the, the volume, how large that pit should be that is, is dug, for instance. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, it is its own kind of local, you know, division of labor. They force those uh, Ukrainian peasants, the girls, especially who were left as part of the home front, as we interviewed those um, witnesses and participants who were requisitioned and forced to dig the grave, um, to uh, cl clean up the area, uh, you know. So um, there, a system was developed um, very quickly um, in the summer of 41. Um, and uh, to the extent that they could, uh, with more German forces like Waffen SS and, and other forces, carry out these much larger mass shootings at Babi Yar, as you mentioned. Um, but this, this is the kind of, you know, smaller version of it, smaller scale version of it. But as you mentioned in the beginning, we know now the map of Ukraine is just, you know, almost every, anywhere where there was a Jewish community, you know, the killers went to them. It's not that the killer, that the, that the Jews were deported to camps. It was the killers going to those locations, um, carrying out these mass shootings quickly, um, uh, you know, and, and very little traces. I mean, we see casings, bullet casings on it. We have bones in the landscape. We don't have, I don't have, um, there's very little documentation. I, I, on, on the German documentation for this killing, uh, 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 there was that one file in 1969, but from the wartime, I didn't find anything about this actual um, murder. Right, you know, you've referred to the fact that many German soldiers took photographs in spite of the fact that the Officially, they were discouraged from taking photographs and certainly discouraged from circulating the photographs of their family back home. In your book, you refer to a little known prosecution of one German officer who, in fact, was prosecuted for an atrocity photo he shared with his family. Could you tell us about that incident? Um, that is this, this um, Taubner case. And what's really Max Teubner actually is a correct pronunciation. There's an umlaut over the A. Um, this is really astounding because he was found guilty of excessive barbarism, unworthy of a man in uniform. Um, and that, that excessive bar barbarism included, quote, taking tasteless and shameless pictures, including one of a naked Jewish woman, and openly bragging about these photos to his wife and friends back in Germany. By taking photographs of the incidents or having photographs taken and having them developed in photographic shops and showing them off, the accused is guilty of disobedience. Okay, So he wasn't actually convicted for murder for the actual killing of the Jews. Um, and that was considered, you know, in the um, in this one, this is a very rare wartime case. It's really the only known instance when Himmler put one of his own SS officers on trial in connection with the killing of Jews. But it was not about killing the Jews per se, because that was already a state policy, but it was against uh, the rules to take these pictures and then show them around and brag about them. And of course, you know, Himmler kept issuing orders starting as soon as the mass, uh, the mass murder started, so did those um, orders for uh, not taking photos, for banning uh, the photography of them. But they couldn't; they could not control that because they were also um, encouraging people to, to take pictures of the war as a glorious chapter in history and um, and providing cheap uh, handheld cameras and promoting that. So it was a kind of a, a contradiction of um, uh, there's uh, of, of efforts there, um, and so that you know, so we have these photographs. But many of them were destroyed because they were incriminating um, or they were confiscated during the war by the SS and police. 
Um, uh, so it is, you know, this is a rare photograph. People uh, are surprised by that when I um, talk about this photograph. They assume that there is just, you know, there are a lot of photographs of the Holocaust, um, but very few that, that are this, that this incriminating that actually show um, the killing. The photographer took uh, at least five from this day. This was his kind of main, the main photograph that he took. Um, but he took some other ones to show the process that the, you know, how things um, were carried out step by step by step. Oh, Wendy, we're now marking the 75th anniversary of the opening of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, the first and the most famous of the 13 trials that were organized there. What, in your view, is the legacy of Nuremberg today? Mm. Well, there are some um, on the visual side, I mean, we're talking about Nuremberg. Um, it is an interesting example of the use of photography and even um, film footage in the trial. And Lawrence Douglas and others have written about that. So it's important to point out that some of the first images of the Holocaust, you know, the uh, Polish underground um, is very, they were systematically collecting these uh, uh, atrocity images as they found them on dead soldiers or wherever they could find them. Um, Jews themselves um, already uh, were part of the world of photography. Many of them had photo studi studios and were active photographers um, even before the war and had that skill. And um, so they were secretly taking pictures, um, Kaddish in, in the Kovno ghetto and um, you know, other uh, uh, Heinrich Ross in the Witch ghetto. So um, the, these photos were, and, and even someone like Simon Wiesenthal was running around trying to get these images and they were burying them during the war. So that pursuit of justice uh, was very much a part of, of how Jews responded and witnesses responded in the part of the resistance movement um, as these atrocities were unfolding. Um, and they were, you know, it was tricky too because that, um, the war contained that visual um, kind, of, kind of competition, you know, I mean, uh, Stalin had his money shot on top of the Reichstag and the Americans had Iwo Jima. And so this was very much a visual war and that was part of the, uh, the um, campaign. Um, and so at Nuremberg, when um, the allies, you know, uh, undertook this uh, massive um, trial, the international trial and the subsequent trials, these images were very much a part of how the cases were prosecuted and how people came to discover uh, the Holocaust. Um, and, and even our memory, um, you know, there's a very important image from um, Latvia, from Leopaya of the Epstein family. Um, and a book has just come out about that, um, uh, that just by, I just saw it this morning that it was released. Um, and that was brought um, in part of the Nuremberg presentation of, of evidence. Um, so I, I think that um, the ways that prosecutors put their cases together and all the resources that they drew upon, um, artifacts, images, testimony. They built this archive in many ways for us. Um, audio, we have um, uh, the recordings of the Nuremberg trials. Uh, so I think obviously the story of, of justice and the, and the um, introduce, introduction of these crimes, crimes against humanity, um, the introduction of the word genocide, um, in 1946, uh, it's all part of, of the legacy of, of Nuremberg. But you know, as far as the um, evidence collected too, and under incredible circumstances in, in Germany, it had been bombed, and uh, resources were uh, really um, um, hard to come by. And stories of people, you know, in the Palace of Justice, like walking through rubble, and I mean, so it's a, an incredible story of of, of justice, but. The legacy for me uh, as an historian is really just this amazing amount of, of material as these prosecutors came to discover a lot of what we know today. They, right. knew, they knew early on though that um, this was going to be a legacy of, of the Third Reich and um, Telford Taylor wrote about that as he was preparing the subsequent trials. It, was, it became very clear um, that this was kind of the crime of all crimes that um, the Nazis had committed. Yes. Wendy, thank you. I know we have questions from our audience, and I'll turn back now to Audrey to help us introduce those questions. Okay. Hi. Hi. We have a number of questions. Uh, first one from Ruth. She asks, 
I recall photos taken in the Warsaw Ghetto. Does that connect to this notion of atrocity photography? Um, yes, there were photos, well, a lot of different photos taken in the Warsaw Ghetto um, uh, during the, the span of that, um, uh, the existence of that ghetto, uh, which would, you know, was 1940 till the, the end of the war uh, and the reoccupation of, of Warsaw by the, by the, or by Poland, by the Soviets. Um, I, I think you're, uh, the participant may be referring to the Stroop album, which was also part of the Nuremberg trials. It was brought into evidence. And that's a classic example of how German officials put photo albums together as a culture of uh, kind of administrative um, bragging or, <laughs> or also uh, part of the kind of uh, working towards your superior, working towards the Fuhrer, um, that the uh, Stroop in this case who was in charge of the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto had this destruction, his work, photographed and documented, put into a photo album and then presented it to his boss to say, look, this is what I did. And this happened also in the camps at Auschwitz. A new album has emerged, um, came out from under the sink of a former commandant from Sobibor, really rare uh, artifact just, just in German now, hopefully will come out in English, that book. Um, and that was an album that had been created you know, for uh, for the boss or for back in Berlin to show off um, the, um, in this case, um, the um, operations of, of Sobibor um, and also showing uh, in that album very clearly the collaboration and the camaraderie between the Travniki men or including Demjanjuk um, and the German officials there. So yes, these are albums um, that, uh, and the Lily Jacobs album, that's a, a Yad Vashem. Uh, so we have hundreds of these, um, albums that were created by, by the Nazi officials and, and they're critical to our understanding of these, uh, of these operations and these murders. We have another question. Uh, you've done so much investigation from just one photograph. Is there the same possibility for other photographs taking of other atrocities? Uh, yes. Um, in fact, uh, I, I start the book by posing the question, what does one do when one discovers a photograph of murder, uh, of any murder that has occurred historically, uh, whether it's um, a lynching or an image from the Armenian genocide or really any um, piece of evidence like that. Um, when, you know, to, what, how do you respond to that as a person? You know, um, perhaps, you know, you're starting that investigation you, um, in, in an historical way. Um, uh, and that, you know, that was really what, what set me off on this, on this path was that it was so clearly an image of murder um, and that, it, you know, I wasn't kind of solving the murder. We, we know what happened in the Holocaust, but actually trying to restore that history. And, 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 and the biggest challenge was to try to find um, the family at the center of the photograph. Uh, which was uh, turned out to be the hardest task. I, that, that surprised me. I thought it was going to be um, easier to find the family. And the fact that I couldn't with 100% certainty identify the family came very close, um, you know, gave me pause as far as the reality of genocide and what genocide errors pursue, uh, which is complete erasure and suppression. And that this kind of research is kind of, is, is trying to, fight against that, um, the, the identity of the victims were, that was supposed to be uh, lost to us and that we have people that, you know, missing, um, that, have, that no one really came forward as far as I can tell um, to claim this family as missing. I, I came very close. I may have found the cousin of the little boy in there, but what about all the people who, uh, all the victims who just, you know, are, we, are not registered um, as missing, and that's that's the that's the story. That's the big part of, of the genocide. That um, uh, those are the missing missing that we we need to find out what happened to them and who they are and make and make that ever. That's that's kind of what we do to um, in the act of prevention and as well um, in understanding what happened. And you have the photograph of the family. Is that is that true? I have this photograph is as close as I got. And that 
is uh, a, a, a very, another <laughs> really rare photograph. Um, you know, that the one of, of the murder, uh, the focus of the book, um, incredibly rare action shot, and this an incredibly rare image portrait, family portrait from 1941 uh, from Mirapol. Uh, what was left, uh, and this was taken um, probably a month or so, two months before, um, so between July and October 41. Uh, the women and children are what's left. The men have been killed or they evacuated. And it was just striking to me as I was going through the pages of testimony of Hashem that the, um, a, dis, a, a cousin of these, of these children here who, had, who evacuated with her family um, and then came back after the war. And she was only five years old when she was evacuated. So it was hard to, for her to identify uh, the people in the image. Um, but she came back and was given this photograph as far as this is what's left of your family. And um, it, it was attached, to, she attached it to the page of testimony that she deposited at Yad Vashem where she just declared that I had a family in Mirapol that was killed in the park and shot um, in, in um, October, 1941. Uh, and I visited with her and the stories that she told me matched with the other stories I'd collected. Um, but, uh, we couldn't, you know, she couldn't say for certain that, that, that image, that family image and that boy and that child is, um, not the same as, as the woman and then the two children. Uh, so it would be, this is her, um, sorry, this is her, uh, aunt and it would be this woman and these two children. That's making me emotional. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful photograph. Yeah, it is. Uh, we have a few more questions and a few more minutes. Um, one of the striking things about the photograph is that there are no other victims in view where there are other victims standing and watching. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, and this is why I moved the book at the end towards, towards the shoes, um, as far as the empty shoes, the crumpled coat, the gaps in knowledge, the victims whom we cannot see, the many who were murdered and remained missing. Um, and in my book, I uh, work through the list of the other victims and describe how they were brought to that site. And, um, and then you can, can read how our victims in this photograph that, you know, they were part of this, um, this group, this community, and the other victims were standing um, nearby. Uh, and in fact, the Germans had miscalculated um, the number uh, whom they could actually round up that day. And the action had to stop um, and while these the Jews had not been shot, the ones who had not been shot were in this spot and they had to wait while the, the Ukrainian girls and, 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 and Jewish men who were also shot then quickly um, dug two more trenches. So yes, there were um, other victims there, uh, somewhere between two and 300 uh, were shot that day. Um, um. We have about two more questions. Um, Joshua, you might be able to speak to this as well. I know photography as an act of resistance did occur in the Holocaust, such as the Sonderkommando photos. Do you know of more? I defer to Wendy, but let me just say that on the Eastern Front, uh, there were many photographers within this, the uh, framework of the Red Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them happened to be Jewish. And they took not only photos at the front of the fighting, but they took photos of liberation moments. Uh, there are a famous set of photographs in the Crimea at Kerch. Mm -hmm. It's a little known fact that the, probably the first massacre site to be found, to be discovered by the Allies was, early, was it in late December 1941, early January 1942. The Crimea had been occupied by the Germans and they killed about 7,000 Jews in Kerch. And then the Soviet army counterattacked and liberated the territory. And they found the massacre so soon after it had taken place 
that the Germans had not managed to bury the victims. And so we have photographs of that massacre very soon after it took place. And then the Germans counterattacked themselves and took control of the Crimea again, and it wasn't liberated till later in the war. So that's a very interesting moment in time. And that massacre in Kerch was, was documented by Soviet Jewish photographers. It was commemorated by a Soviet Jewish officer who was a poet, uh, Ilya Selvinsky, and that was widely reported in the Soviet press in 1942. So the issue of photography, of visual evidence, uh, enters into our consciousness, especially on the Eastern Front, very early. Um, and then, of course, once the Allies on the West begin uh, liberating territory in Germany, and then um, the Soviets move into Poland and liberate Majdanek and then Treblinka, which was destroyed, and then Auschwitz in January 44, there's, 45, there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, visual photography mm -hmm. that coincides with the liberation and what the liberators found. And there we have newsreels as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's there's there is a lot in circulation and in private um, settings as well. Uh, I had the opportunity to and and everything, Josh. I completely agree with you that these are out there. They're um, used by the propaganda ministries, um, and then they're used, you know, immediately as the allies. Uh, I was just looking at some uh, psychological warfare OSS material here in the Yale archives, um, you know, and then they're used to. Uh, uh, re-educate the Germans to the, the confronting the atrocities campaign that um, look at this. And, and so a lot of the images, including the one of Elie Wiesel and Buchenwald that was immediately um, distributed in, in 44, or sorry, in 45, um, after that liberation as part of a kind of re-education campaign. So the um, imagery is is out there. It's, it's in the underground. It's in people's um, pockets and, and in their uh, within their homes. I, I interviewed a, a woman outside of Dachau, who um, Maria Zeidenberger, uh, who was a photo technician, uh, like an 18, 19 year old uh, girl at the time. Um, and she was processing, she told me she was um, developing prints from soldiers who came back and it was, you know, photo atrocity photography. It was uh, emaciated POWs, it was um, killings and, and uh, pogroms and um, you know she and she was part of, of the resistance actually she was sharing sneaking those images out sharing them with some of the prisoners um, in Dachau whom she knew who were working in the fields around her house who were out, allowed to work outside the camp uh, she was hiding some of those images in her beehive um, and that was then funneling back to the resistance um, in, in Czechoslovakia so this was the kind of thing that the Nazis were trying to suppress and prevent um, because, you know, it was, it's such a powerful piece of evidence. Um, and, and, um, and survivors themselves, I was curious about the issue of the use of these and the sensitivities of, of using them and respecting the survivor community. And I was surprised when I went through the video testimony at the Shoah Foundation in, in uh, USC and did a systematic search on photos. And um, at the end of those testimonies, anyone who's looked at them knows that often the family photographs come out at the end um, in a kind of um, tribute to, to the survivors who restored their lives and built their lives. But um, very often during the interviews, the survivors will hold up uh, an atrocity photo. And often, sometimes it's the same photo. It's been reproduced so many times and kind of part of that discourse of resistance. And they hold it up put it in front of the camera. Uh, and sometimes the interviewer, and this is like in the 1990s, um, collecting that story, the interviewer will look away. <laughs> I don't want to see that. And the survivor is going, look at this. This is what happened to us. Don't forget. So I, you know, it's an interesting discussion over, you know, should you look, should you not look, you know, who, who's speaking on behalf of whom in terms of what's the etiquette, what's appropriate. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't have an, an answer. Obviously, my book is a way. My answer, as far as they, I believe they should be uh, handled with care, but heavily, deeply researched because there are stories there to be told. It's evidence, and they are shocking and they are upsetting. But they're the reality of of the Holocaust of what happened. 
Absolutely. And I, I can't speak to that, but I think you could agree that you're fighting for history and for memory. And the most important thing is that we remember and not forget. And um, Wendy, I want to give you the final word, but thank you just so much for doing this work and um, pursuing this history. And it, it's so important and so powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. I don't have any any parting words per se. I, 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 I've talked so much um, and I just so appreciate this opportunity. Um, I, I'm, and I, I really, I, so astounded by the reaction to this book. Um, um, and I, people are sharing their stories. I was telling you earlier, the emails I've been getting, I'm sorry if I, I can't respond to them, all of them, I'm gonna try. I'm glad I'm on sabbatical, I have more time. But that the photo is this, as I said in the beginning, can propel, can be this agent of change, can, can bring, can open up new, um, new, new discoveries and things. So I just think it's fascinating that a photo like this, which was so central to this man's life that haunted him for the rest of his life, that was his act of resistance, is now becoming kind of a vehicle for sharing these stories um, and also for um, showing how these, these photographs can be in some ways a, a form of, of redress uh, for these kinds of historical crimes. Thank you so much, Joshua. Thank you as well for coming and speaking and giving your time. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in from home and showing up for authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and the incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. Um, check out the chat if you're interested in supporting Wendy and Harvard Bookstore and buying a copy of The Ravine. It's an amazing book. It's, um, it's historic and how important it is. And please remember to shop indie and shop local from all of us at Harvard Bookstore. Be well, have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. Yeah.